May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Well, we made it to Thanksgiving weekend, but since the year is 2020, I wouldn't have been surprised if the provincial government had cancelled it. People are in COVID despair everywhere. But not we Christians, as long as we have Jesus Christ, we can endure anything. So it's a time for we humans to examine what indeed we are grateful for. Trouble is, that's such a huge question. It's too large to take in. It's like someone saying, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Oh, I don't know. So much easier if one was asked where in Canada we would like to live. The answer is obvious. It's Sudbury. Or maybe not. And apologies to anyone who's listening who's from Sudbury. So I spent this week pondering what especially we should be grateful for at this particular time. And it kept coming back to me that the thing most people are missing because of the pandemic is community. In our extended families, hugging is dangerous. We certainly cannot act with our friends like we used to. And in some areas, going to a restaurant or Tim Hortons is fraught with possible danger. We just feel more separated. As it happens, our service starts with the gathering of the community, so I thought I'd talk about community today, because that's something we still need to be thankful for in these difficult times. Now, it's possible to break down community into many parts, but for simplicity, I'd like to look at what I see as four major components. And I hope that will help us to see what an important contribution each one makes to the life and witness of the church. And I thought it would be helpful to look at some inspiring contributions that have been made by individuals in each of these groups. The first group is the one that presents us with the greatest challenge. And that is the young church, the children and the youth. And the problem is the way that we view them. We tend to see them as the future of our community of faith. But we are doing ourselves no favors if that's the only way we view the young people, as the church of tomorrow. That's going to cause three problems. First, we're going to waste too much of our energy fretting about, about, fretting about how we mature these tender young plants. The answer is quite easy. Draw them together. Let them learn from each other and from our example. Second, in focusing or worrying about them, we'll forget to take care of the important fact that we need to grow just as much as they do. Remember, the Christian life is a journey, and it's a unique one. If we're not going forward, it usually means we're going back. It's very difficult to stay in one place, even in the desert. We need to remember that we need to grow spiritually, even in this time of COVID-19. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, if we see them only as the church of tomorrow, we're going to miss out on the incredible contribution children make now to the story of Christian witness. Let me give you an example. I doubt if any of you have heard of Naomi Cook. She's a little girl who comes from my hometown of Wrexham in North Wales. In the late 1980s, at a time when communist regimes all over Eastern Europe were collapsing, seven-year-old Naomi was watching television with her parents. The news was on and was featuring the collapse of the communist government in Romania. A new newscast was showing terrible pictures of little children and babies abandoned in the orphanages, many tied to their beds to keep them under control. Naomi's heart was touched, and she turned to her father, Dave Cook, and said, can't I send some of my toys to those children? Well, naturally, her, children's, her father said no, but she kept persisting. An active Christian, he was also a journalist, so he got one of his friends to put out an appeal on the local radio for people to donate gifts for the orphans of Romania. He thought it might be just possible to drive to Romania with one van to at least one of the orphanages. The response was completely overwhelming. And eight weeks later, 10 fully loaded semi-trailers packed with shoeboxes, 
each one containing gifts for his child, left Wrexham, and the first delivery of what was later to become Operation Christmas Child was underway. Now, Operation Christmas Child delivers over 800,000 shoeboxes to countries as diverse as Nicaragua, Jordan, and Nigeria. But just listen to the effect of Naomi's vision in that first year at an orphanage in Huendoara, Romania. This is from Dave Cook's report. The conditions of filth and degradation were almost indescribable. Children were tied to their cots by ropes. One child was imprisoned in his cot by means of a straitjacket. To control the plague of mites and lice, many children had been shaved bald. But the instant the children began receiving their shoeboxes, the atmosphere burst into life, as if a giant Christmas candle had been lit, which flooded the room with light. The volunteers found themselves embraced and kissed by children starved of human affection, by children who had never expected to receive a present, to receive a present in their lives. That's quite a moving report. And all this joy grew out of the heart of one little girl in North Wales and has now grown into a worldwide movement. Let us rejoice in the fact that children see things in a different way and have exciting visions that they believe are possible. Let's not stand in their way. So if I've considered the young church first, perhaps the next group to look at is parents. <clears throat> I've always maintained that parenting is one of the hardest things that one can be asked to do. But paradoxically, it is also one of the most joy-filled things. And there is no doubt that the job of parenting should grab a large section of one's focus if that's the role you're in. I remember when I became a real Christian, a real Christian, not the dipsy-doodle, church festivals twice a year, oh, I love that warm, fuzzy Sunday feeling, now here comes Monday, whose head can I roll over to further my career, sort of Christian that I was for the first 30 years of my life. No, when I became a real Christian, I was advised very early on in my walk with the Lord that I should make my priorities first God, second family, and everything else third, including the work that God had for me. And I've always tried to do that, and by and large it works. So I recommend it to you. Now I know parenting can be a drain in terms of energy, and it can certainly be a source of worry. But the thing I like about being a Christian parent is that when one thinks, usually in despair, that there's nothing left to do, one can always pray. And I do think parents are one of, and I do stress one of, I'm not saying the only, I do think they are one of the principal pillars of prayer support in the community. Indeed, it's an old cliche that says, that says praying mothers are the strongest force in the universe. I'm not sure if that's true, but it can certainly feel like that sometimes. I have an example here from the Alpha Course. It's the account of a conversion. James Hudson Taylor was a young teenager brought upon a farm in Yorkshire, England in the mid-19th century. His family were devout Christians, but he turned into a rebellious teenager to the despair of his mother. One day, while his mother was away, he picked up a Christian book, intending to read the story, but skip the moral. The thought occurs to me, by the way, that being a rebellious teenager 150 years ago is very different from today. But I digress. As he read, he was struck by the phrase, the unfinished work of Christ. James thought that Christianity was dreary, a terrible way to pay off one's sins. He just wanted to have a good time. But the phrase opened his mind to the realization that Christ had already paid for his sins by his death on the cross. And with this dawned the joyful conviction that led by the Holy Spirit, there was nothing to do but surrender to Christ. Ten days later, his mother came home. He ran to the door to tell her he had glad news to give her. She hugged him and told him, oh, I already know. I know, my boy, I've been rejoicing for over a week in the glad tidings that you have to tell me. She had been 80 miles away on the very day of the conversion incident, and she felt such an overwhelming desire to pray for Hudson 
that she spent hours on her knees and had arisen with an unshakable conviction that her prayers had been answered. Well, James Hudson Taylor went on to found the China Inland Mission, and through their work they have influenced millions for Christ. But in all his work, Hudson Taylor, through the example of his mother, never forgot the importance of prayer. So thank God for praying parents. But it isn't God's plan for everyone to be living as part of an immediate family. Some have yet to move into that season of their lives, and for others, God has a different plan. But this group of single adults are another important element in our community. Firstly, they represent another pillar of prayer support. But I think two other gifts they especially bring are energy and vision. I was never more struck by that than when I was living in Hong Kong and was privileged to meet Jackie Pullinger. Some of you may know of her book, Chasing the Dragon. As a young single teacher in England some 50 years ago, she suddenly had a strong conviction that she should go to Asia to preach the gospel. She booked a passage on a boat destined for Japan, but ended up in Hong Kong in a place called the Walled City. It was an area in the middle of Hong Kong where, because of an historic accident in drawing boundaries, neither the Chinese or British exercised any authority. It was a shanty town of cardboard and corrugated iron huts, crazily, crazily leaning on each other with no electricity or sanitation. In this environment, the trad gangs ruled over an empire of murder, crime, and drugs. And into this dark world walked Jackie Pullinger, who established a mission and a center for young people to recover their lives. Her story is quite extraordinary. I do recommend the book. But suffice it to say that after 30 years, her ministry in the war garden flourished amid a testimony of, of lives completely turned around by Christ, of drug addicts freed of their addiction to heroin without withdrawal symptoms, and murderers and criminals freed of their sins to live productive lives in the name of Jesus. My wife Chester and I went to one of her prayer meetings in her apartment. It was packed, and I ended sitting on a window ledge with a 50-foot drop behind me. It reminded me of a story in Acts, and I held onto the window frame really tight. But I have to tell you, and I have to tell you, the presence of the Spirit of God was undeniably strong as we worshipped in a spirit of love and unity. So as we consider Jackie Pullinger, we rejoice in the energy and vision that single adults of all ages bring to our community. <clears throat> The fourth and final group is harder to define and name, but it consists of the older members of our community. Definitions can be hard, and I was reminded of that just this week when I came upon a definition of middle age of that, as that period in life when we've worked out the answers to living, but nobody asks us the questions anymore. But I guess by saying older members, I'm referring to those who have a sense of completion of life's major call career, family, or whatever. Not that we should ever preclude that life will not make another major call on us. And that's where we need to appreciate this element of our community. We need to remind ourselves that this group has just as vital and stunning a contribution to make as any others. The difference is that some of the members of this group themselves need to realize they still have a stunning contribution to make. And for inspiration, one needs to look no further than the example of Mother Teresa, who in her late 80s and in failing health, continued to inspire others to bring relief to the starving world while continuing the work herself. Little Naomi Cook, James Hudson Taylor, Jackie Pullinger, and Mother Teresa. Very different witnesses from very different sections of what we consider community, yet each con contributing to the ever-growing Christian witness in very powerful ways. Now, before I pull this all together, let me get rid of two possible misunderstandings. First, I'm not suggesting that any of us should directly copper these people. I'm not suggesting that some of you, after a week-long vigil of prayer, hire a semi-trailer 
drive to Hong Kong and open a little Sisters of Charity convent. No, actually the best thing we can do is take the advice of the Apostle Paul and blossom where we're planted. Second in highlighting particular attributes of each group, I am certainly not saying those attributes belong to that group. All of us have energy and vision, and I am certainly aware of the power contained in the prayers of children. So I hope that dispels any mis misunderstandings in what I've said so far. But to continue, though the stories of the four individuals are impressive, they could not have achieved what they did without the support of community. And that is what we so often forget. In the enthusiasm of our own calling, we can forget that we need others around us so that our dreams, visions, and hopes that God has laid on our hearts can be accomplished. The COVID-19 pandemic has diminished our ability to act as a community. But this Thanksgiving weekend, let's remind each other of what great things we can achieve in community and will continue to be done. And there is only one, to, one way to do that, that is by fixing our eyes firmly on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We have to constantly remind ourselves that he has given us his work to do, and it behoves us to find imaginative ways to uphold the effectiveness of our community of faith in these challenging times. This Thanksgiving Sunday, thanks be to God for the gift of community and the indescribable gift of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've spoken in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.